This Morrison, conference will now be recorded. Uh, I'm Doug Morrison. Uh, as you can hear, I have a strong Scottish accent. I'm the president and the CEO of the Centre for Excellence in Mining Innovation. And what we're talking about today is increasing productivity from deep metal mines. And uh, we'll present what we think is a new operating paradigm for these very deep operations. So here we are as the Centre for Excellence in Mining Innovation. We were originally started to reduce the cost and risk of innovation. We're based in Sudbury, Ontario as a not-for-profit, and we started in 2007. Those were the first four uh, themes that we were uh, given as a mandate to work on to improve uh, uh, for the mines. And in 2012, when I joined the organization, we added a fifth one, which is the business aspect of uh, making these technical solutions work. In actual fact, Mining companies cannot adopt the new technology unless it's a commercially viable product or service that they can buy, buy or hire. And so oftentimes, although we come up with very good research from universities and research organizations, it doesn't make it into operations because there's no commercialization process to make it an acceptable uh, product or service for the mines to buy. So it doesn't move forward. And that's what we were created to try and overcome. And so as time has moved on, we've started a very large deep mining network in uh, 2013. And that was a $35 million program doing a whole range of work in deep mine issues, heat and rock stress and productivity issues in the ultra deep mining network. That was our largest program up until that time. And since then we've moved on and we're now working on a new program but what we've realized is that accelerating the commercialization of these new technologies and techniques is absolutely the key to what we have to accomplish to move the mines into a new way of uh, performing. So it doesn't really matter which of these technical themes you want to focus on, the heat and rock stress issues, uh, increasing productivity, the digital architecture that we have to use to, uh, for the new autonomous vehicles that we will have to use, or whether it's ecological preservation in the environmental space, all of those things have to be commercialized so that the companies can adopt the new technologies and improve their performance. And our new program is called the MICA Network, and it actually stands for the Mining Innovation Commercialization Accelerator Network. And it's there to try and improve the performance of the operations, not just in productivity issues, but also in the environmental space. So that's what what we've moved on to as an organization. We exist in this mining innovation niche, and we use the TRL uh, stages to show where that fits us into the mix. We're not an organization that actually does research. There are very good universities and research labs and other agencies that do good research work. The problem is moving that from a research result into a market-ready solution that companies can use to improve their performance. And so we fit in that space in the TRL 45678 space normally, and we're trying to accomplish commercialization, working with mining service and supply companies, as well as cross-sector SMEs. In other words, innovators in other sectors other than mining that want to come into mining to help uh, uh, provide a service that improves performance. So that's where we fit in the MICA program that we're trying to move forward with, oh, sorry, uh, research is new knowledge, and that's why people get an MSc or a PhD, because they've made a, a contribution to new knowledge. But innovation is quite different from research. It's actually a business enterprise. So you're trying to gain a new business. Research is new knowledge, and innovation is new business. And so most of my colleagues are actually business people who know how to move technical solutions into a new business format. And so... Where, where MICA fits in this, the new program MICA fits in this, is actually focusing even more on the commercialization piece and focuses largely on TRL stages six, seven, and eight, moving late stage developed technologies through to a commercial product where they can move into the marketplace. And the reason we want to do that is because we believe that the big changes that have to take place are in step change innovation, and we want to increase the performance by 200 or 300 percent or decrease the cost to half the cost or to one third of the cost so the decrease is 66 percent because we believe that that's the scale of change that we have to introduce in any one activity that we are engaged in and the reason we 
taken this step is because of a report that came out from Deloitte and Touche way back in 2017 that declared that the mine, uh, mining industry as a whole had declined in its productivity by almost 30%, 28% over the previous decade, from 2007 up to 2017. Whether it's open pit or underground, no matter where they are in the world, overall, the productivity had declined in the industry by almost 30%. And we know why that's happening. It's declining grades, increasing operating costs, escalating capital costs, and reductions of ROI. However, we, we take the view that it's not actually just a de decline of 28%. Because if instead of mining, investing in these mines, you had just put your money in the bank, you would have gotten 2% or so. And so the actual loss for the investor is closer to 50% loss. And the bigger problem is, what do we do now from 27 onward, 2017 onward? Because it's very simple to extend those lines to the next decade, and those are the results. And they're not very attractive results, and uh, that's not a very good answer for us to, to follow. So what should we do? Well, one alternative is to bring in modifications to the existing uh, technologies and improve the technologies that we have. And what we can see is that beginning in 2017, you might be able to half the decline or even stop the decline. But even if you stop the decline because of the improved performance of your uh, equipment, you can see where it takes you on the investment picture. And so what we think is absolutely essential is that actually we need to make bigger changes in the way technology is implemented. And that means reversing the decline. And that means bringing in a real change into a new production paradigm, changing lots of things uh, in the way mines operate. And we're focusing today on the underground mines. So we'll focus on that. So that's the change and the, the scale of change that we want to try and accomplish. It's not small, it's not to say that we always achieve those objectives with our projects, but those are the targets that we aim for. And typically, when you set a target, you're unlikely to exceed your target and you will fall short. But if you have a target of improving things by 10 or 15 percent, that's the best that you will achieve. We aim to much higher than that, and we're not always successful, but sometimes we are. And of course, the other thing to remember is time. Time marches on. And here's where we are today. We're no longer in 2017. And you can decide for yourself where you think we are on this graph. I don't think we've made significant changes in the way mines operate in the last three years. And time marches on every single year. So let's get to some of the solutions then. So uh, our approach to new technology is slightly different. Uh, we look at the business impact of innovation, the conventional approach is simply to identify technologies that might work, compile a technology roadmap of all the possibilities that we might try and conduct pilot or field trials and take it from there and see what works and see what does not work. It's essentially a trial and error approach. Our approach is to say mining innovation is actually a business and we have to be addressing business issues before we start jumping onto the technical solutions. So first of all, analyze the impact on the business of what we're doing analyze the scale of all the many business impacts that we might have. So for example, we might want to increase uh, or decrease the time to the first revenue, accelerate the time to the first revenue. We might want to decrease the total capital investment we have to make to get the project to go forward. And we may want to change the operating process so that we improve the rate return on an investment. All of those will have an impact on the net present value. So which of those do you want to do? which of the one is, is critical to control your operation rather than which technology might have some benefit. So then you prioritize the constraints and the bottlenecks. Each activity in turn in sequence, starting with the biggest, the, the activity that has the biggest impact on your business. And when you've identified that biggest impact, then you go and either find the resolution or design the resolution of the bottleneck. And you do that in sequence moving from the biggest to the next biggest and the next biggest from there. And so, and those solutions are not necessarily technological. We tend to focus largely on technological solutions, but it can be a scientific advance, or it can just be an organizational change that actually makes the improvement happen. And in terms of a graph, this is what we look at when we consider a business impact of innovation. The red line is what we do today, and we're trying to improve things tomorrow by increase, increasing the, the net present value of the project. 
One way is to accelerate the time to first revenue, so you start to generate uh, profits sooner. Another way is to decrease the capital investment, and another way is to improve the process so that you improve the return on investment. All of those can have an effect, but the biggest effects are number one, as accelerating revenue has the biggest effect on net present value. The second is decreasing the capital investment, and the third is actually improving the ROI. Uh, and same way, we actually believe that you need to focus on step change innovation. Small incremental changes will not have the scale of effect that we need to have. And so we think it's a step change innovation is the main process. And so we use this business approach. And the business approach is the theory of constraints. You do the analysis to figure out what is the impact on the biggest problem that your business has. Then try and address the technical bottom or identify the technical bottlenecks. And there's a book written called The Goal uh, of Performance Improvements, and it, it says that you should basically focus on throughput, and that's throughput of ore in our case, the inventory cost, and the operating expenses. And you use the operating expenses to increase the throughput of your operation and decrease the inventory cost of your operation. And those are the only three things to focus on. What that allows us to do is to say, in actual fact, we're moving on from a technology roadmap, which is just like a map. It's just, it is exactly like a map. It says these are the technologies available. These are the cities you can travel to in the map that you have. And you can pick and choose which one you want to use. The GPS, on the other hand, is kind of like this theory of constraints approach, systems approach, which says we actually have lots of constraints. And so we're not completely free to go to any destination that we want to go to on the map. Some mines have some other different conditions from others. Some are shaft constrained, for example. Some are open pits, etc. So you have to decide the technology that suits you in the context of your operation. If you're very deep and very hot, then you have to take account of the heat conditions. If you're relatively shallow, you don't need to do that. So it's not which technology is the best technology. It's which technology is the best one for you in your circumstance. And so that's essentially changing all of those things all the time as your mind gets deeper and deeper the conditions change and so you change the technologies to suit and so it becomes more like a gps system replacing a static paper map that we might use in our map so now the other argument that people say is well innovation step change innovation in particular is a high risk and there's no question it is there's a risk associated with changing anything but that's only a real risk if in your business no innovation means there's no risk but that is not true for us in our mining business because if your operations have anything like increasing depth, increasing heat, increasing cost in your future, then your net present value of the project is actually declining all the time because of the erosion of those factors. So if, as your mine gets deeper and hotter and more costly to operate, you do not change your production process, then you're actually becoming less and less profitable. So no productivity improvements means a declining net present value for the project. And it means a declined or a smaller net present value for the next project using the same technology as you use now. So here we go. Let's talk about the actual technologies because that's really what everybody mostly wants to talk about. We believe that the future means that all of our equipment underground has to be electrified, has to become autonomous, it has to be continuous operations. And we have to lean the production process in very much the way that the manufacturing industry has done. And it also has to become much more sustainable in terms of how we manage our waste streams. So the new operating paradigms for mines will be new tailings, new, new tailings storage systems that allow us to have full and final closure, uh, self-sustaining systems. We'll have many fewer people underground because we'll use a lot more autonomous vehicles. And the few people that we do have underground will be protected in a much more comprehensive way with their PPE, the comprehensive PPE. The comparison I would make is with soldiers from the era of the Second World War versus soldiers in the military today. Because it's a much smaller force and a much more professional, professional force, you can afford to spend a great deal more money on the individual uh, equipment that the individual soldier carries. And so they become a much more sophisticated force. That's the kind of change that will take place with people. Ventilation, mines are now becoming so deep, below 2.5 kilometers, it becomes very hot and very humid, and it becomes extremely expensive to, to, to 
supply cooling ventilation to the entire underground space. We will have to move at some stage to targeted cooling. And I actually think that uh, below 2.5 kilometers, we're already at the place where we have to deliver targeted cooling to critical areas. And the best way to do that, we think, is with liquid air decompression. Oxygen and nitrogen being decompressed gives a cooling effect. And that cooling effect is applied only to the areas where we need it to be, not to the entire underground space. Communication systems are improving all the time. We still think mentally of a picture where we have people in a control room on surface with multiple screens and the controller is then manipulating the information that comes in and making changes. In actual fact, very, very soon, 95% of all the communications on the ground will be machine to machine communications, not machines to humans. The humans are actually slowing down the flow of information to make decisions. It is very easy to set up operational protocols for them, rights of way, et cetera, for equipment so that they all know which vehicle in which situation has priority. And it's not down to individuals driving the vehicle, flashing lights to let the other guy know that they can go first and he'll go second. This machine-to-machine -machine communication is very close to where we will be next. And that means that the human intervention will be much, much smaller. And it will basically be to uh, renew the supplies for the equipment and to manage the failures that happen underground, which require some intelligence and some dexterity to resolve. All the simplistic or very simple processes that we have underground should be done autonomously. All of those things together then will bring us to high capacity production, autonomous vehicles, continuous production systems, and upgrading the value of the old product that we bring to surface. Another issue is rock breakage, and we think it will be still continue to be with explosives, although all the equipment will be digitally controlled and it will be autonomous. So we really will not have people manually wiring off the face that we have where we have up at the present time. And the last thing is rapid access development. As I said earlier, one of the fast, best things you can do to improve your net present value is to get into production sooner. And in underground mine developments, that means rapid access development. And we think the best way to make that happen is with an autonomous sequential process. So looking at those lists, today we will not be addressing uh, new tailage storage systems. So we'll leave that for now. And we'll actually start at the bottom of this list with rapid access development and work our way through all these systems right to the top. So the issue for us is accessing new ore bodies sooner. And there's been a decline in advance rates over the last 50 years. I've been working in the industry since 1981, and I've seen a lot of these changes take place. And we know why it's been happening. It's because there was an increase, a need for increased safety. We used to have a very, very poor safety record. Now it's an excellent safety record. We also had to increase the amount of ground control that we put into place. As mines became deeper, the stresses were higher and the ground control requirements increased. And because we were using larger equipment, the scale of operations increased as well. These are all the reasons why the rate of advance of our dress, typically five meters square or six meters square, became slower and slower. And that's really what's happened to us over these years. By the time we've got to 2000, uh, in the Sudbury operations on central Canadian operations in Manitoba, uh, Ontario, and Quebec, we were moving at about eight meters a day. Uh, by 2010, it was down to about four meters a day. And nowadays, with rock busting on the face, a lot of our advance rates are less than three meters per day. And that is one of the things that kills the net present value of a project because it takes so long to get to the new ore body. And the reason this is the case, I believe, is because we've chosen to focus on the efficiency of the equipment in the development cycle, and we should have focused on the effectiveness of the entire system process. And so that's what we need to go back to and look at, and that's what we've done. So when we look at the process, the actual activities you engage in when you're involved in an advance of a, a phase, so we think by 2025, the target should be 10 to 12 meters a day. And that's really where we need to get to. So that's, if you think we're at three meters today, then that is uh, three or four times faster than we're going now. So when you look at the process, this is how it breaks down. We have a base case, which is the blue histograms, which show where the problems lie. And we're bringing in three uh, innovations. One are canopies, which we'll describe in a second, a second, is continuous uh, ore removal, 
and then rapid ore removal, all of which makes the cycle then go faster. So you can see from the blue histograms where the problems lie, the tallest one, uh, but if you add up all of those activities, it adds up to a cycle time of about 16 and a half hours, between 16 and 17 hours. So it's not possible to compress all of those activities and end up with a cycle time that can be completed in one shift. And that really means, operationally, it means less than 10.5 hours because you have travel time in and out. So critical time is 16 and a half hours, can't compress it. So one way to say we have to tackle the biggest issue one is the bolting cycle, which is by far and away the longest activity we have in the whole cycle. And the next one, of course, is then the mucking cycle. So those are the first two targets because they're the biggest uh, time cons consumers in the process. If we can move to a continuous uh, bring in canopy systems that allow us to do the bolting activities at the same time as we do the drilling and charging at the phase, then we can remove some of the bolting time from the critical path cycle time. We're not reducing the amount of bolts that we install. We simply do a lot of the bolting at the same time as we do the drilling and loading at the face, and that means we compress the critical path. This is what those canopies would look like. There are three canopies on the left. One is the front canopy. Uh, underneath there is a jumbo that's drilling and charging at the face, and on the right you can see it has a face shield to protect the equipment from uh, rock bursting that happens on the face when you're 2.5 kilometers, kilometers below surface. Uh, there's a middle canopy which really just protects the body of the, the jumbo drill and allows people to travel from the back to the front. And the back canopy is a third canopy and it is a different canopy insofar as it has mesh on the outside that we bolt through the frame and attach that mesh to the, the, the excavation in the normal conventional way. So you have a bolting rig at the back whether it's uh, manual or automated, it doesn't matter. We've designed the system so that we can use whatever systems are currently used. It's just allowing these activities to happen concurrently. And so we can reduce the phase cycle in phase 1B, reduce the phase cycle time to about eight hours. So all of that activity is completed within an eight hour period. Those canopies are not just a fixed canopy, they actually come, they actually change their shape. So that in, in the smallest shape they have on the left, that's a contracted position uh, for really, for moving the, the, the frames up and down the drift. Once you move it into position at the face, then you can move it out sideways, it expands laterally with uh, hydraulics or electric actuators, expands out to the walls, and then it expands vertically up to the roof, and that's the largest size it can be. And the advantage of that is that when you move those canopies back out of the heading, ready for the blast, you can actually use the smallest position fits inside the larger ones. And so these three canopies actually become nested as you move them back up away from the face, ready for the blast. Those canopies can be nested inside one another. They are a big, huge, heavy piece of steel. They're very ugly and cumbersome but that's not uh, the point. The point is it helps you to do concurrent activities and change the advance rate cycle time. So what you achieve when you do that is you have continuous loading. Uh, once you've achieved the, the contraction with the, uh, with the bolting and the drilling the face with the canopies, the next thing you have to do is to change the second target, which is the mucking cycle. And that just means moving the ore or the broken rock out of the heading as fast as possible. So. What we've managed to do here is to reduce that marking cycle by about 1.8 hours. You have to add more time because you have to move those canopies around, and so that's a disadvantage. But the overall balance is that you reduce the critical path cycle time by about six hours. And what that achieves is you reduce it from 16.5 hours to roughly less than 10.5 hours, and that allows us to complete two complete advanced cycles in one day. So two cycles in a day and that takes you to the advances that we make. So, there are rapid continuous rock removal systems that move ore out of the heading very quickly. Two of those uh, rail-based systems are very efficient in what they do. One is called the rail bear system and the other one is a mucka high system. Uh, the rail bear has a, a rail on the floor, on the, on the ground, in the drift, and the mucka high system has a rail on the roof. What we focused our attention on was a mascot system 
which is an autonomous wheeled vehicle, which also allows us to use uh, continuous loading, but with no rail system whatsoever. It basically looks like the picture here in the longitudinal view. It's nothing more than a conventional continuous loader loading into three cars behind it. But the three cars are designed to move up the rock from one car, the first car, to the second car, to the third car. So it automatically moves that material back because there's a small chain conveyor in the floor of the car, and that moves the material to the back. This was based on an old idea that looks like this. And I actually operated one of these machines way back in 1981. It was a very, very dangerous machine with that bucket moving past your face. I only operated it for two weeks, and I was very happy to be relieved of that responsibility. You can see in the picture here, it was on track. It was powered by compressed air, and that was the system that was used at the time. They brought in other cars behind the one that you see here in the picture, which moved the, the rock in that car into the car behind it, into the car behind that. And then a, a small battery local would come in and pull all that rock away, and that's how we moved muck out of the face way back in 1980. However, that was quickly replaced by the uh, load haul dump machines that we use today and that we've used ever since. And we'll come back to the efficiencies of that kind of a system uh, later. But here we are with what we call the Moscow system. This is what it looks like in plan view, which is you make the cars narrow enough so that you can have two rows of cars moving in behind the continuous loader. That makes it possible then to have the continuous loader operate continuously without stopping. So that as the loader moves rock into the first car, the white one, which is empty, that one then discharges, self discharges backwards into the second yellow car, and it discharges back into the green car. And once that green car is full, it can leave autonomously and go towards the dump. Once those three cars have been filled, what actually happens is a third, a second row of cars move into position, and all we have to do is to swivel the discharge tray from the continuous loader from one row to the next, and it starts then to fill up the second row of cars, all white, that are moving into position. Once those have moved into position, and the colored cars that you see on the plan have moved out of the heading, you can actually then autonomously move in another set of three cars or four cars to then be ready to receive the next set of rock that is transferred in the second position. And you keep doing that until all of the rock in the heading has been removed. And what that does is it leans the, the process down so there's no lost time in the heading. And that's how we achieve this kind of result. We know that in the, in the heading, the protective canopies allow us to complete all the face activities within eight hours. And if we can complete the rock removal cycle in less than two hours, then we will have a, a cycle thing that's less than 10.5. And that allows us to do two cycles per day. So these are the kinds of changes we could bring in with these kinds of vehicles. It's actually possible to make that oh, that rock move from car to car faster. Now that actually just requires a bigger electric motor now because we're not moving the vehicles, we're just moving the ore from one unit to the next. And that's just the speed at which the conveyor operates. But what that does do for us, if we can, first of all, move the rock faster, and remove another 0.7 hours from the cycle. We can also then re remove another 1.4 hours from the cycle to take us down very close to eight hours for a cycle time. And that means three cycles per day rather than two cycles per day. So where do we get the 1.4 hours? Let's go back to the graph that we looked at when we wrote down the process. And over the, on the extreme left-hand end, we have activities that are called off-shift activities. That's basically like safety talks, it's sometimes having breakfast, it's sometimes refueling the vehicles. Unfortunately, sometimes in our minds, it's actually about finding the vehicles where it was left in the wrong place. So all of that activity is eliminated from this because all the units now are beginning to operate autonomously. And that allows us to gain another 1.4 hours at least. And that means that the critical uh, pass cycle time is reduced First of all, by the six hours, now we can add another 2.5 hours, which is 1.4 plus 1.1. And that gives us a total cycle time of about eight hours, just because we're moving the rock faster from that heading. So that's the activity. The important factor in all these details is that the productivity of the process is controlled by the utilization of the phase, 
not the utilization of the equipment, not the utilization of the people. The most expensive component of the entire process is the value of the face. And so we're maximizing the utilization of the face. What we have in many of our cycles is a lot of time when there is no activity taking place in the heading whatsoever. And what we're trying to accomplish here is by having no dead time at the face. The face is constantly active with one vehicle or another doing the necessary activities. And when you do that, then you move from three meters a day to 8.5 meters a day, which is two times 4.25. Then you can see the change that you have. If you have a three kilometer drive to the new ore body, then you can complete that in 18 months sooner than you otherwise would. And that adds to the net present value. If you can do that at 10 meters a day, then your three kilometer drive can be completed in 300 days, which is almost two years sooner than you would arrive if you did it at three meters per day. And again, you increase more value to the net present value. So there we go. That's for the activity at the face, and it's accelerating revenue from the new ore body that we get to much faster. If we move to rock breakage, there's a lot of discussion, of course, these days about the application of continuous excavation machines. We think that the solution is actually for explosives, but let's have a look at that. Because on paper, you would say, first of all, the drill and blast equipment is moving at three meters a day, that's a very poor performance level. And these large rock excavation machines can move at 20 meters per day. In actual fact, in the very, very hard rock that exists in Northern Canada, Central Canada, it would be very fortunate if those operations, those machines can move at 12 to 14 meters a day just because of the strength of the rock mass that they have to deal with. And I've just gone through a process showing how it's possible to do drill and blast activities that give you 10 to 12 meters per day. And that means that these two systems are much more comparable in terms of the performance levels. And I believe that that's actually the case. These are interchangeable machines or approaches to driving uh, excavations, and they both have their place in long straight tunnels, and in the case of many mines where we don't have long straight tunnels, we have lots of short tunnels to drive. The setup time for these large machines is very, very long. But there's also a risk factor here. First of all, the, the large machines are a single large complex unit. It's a continuous machine, so there's very little time for on-cycle maintenance. Uh, it's on-cycle continuous, and these machines are very large. So if there is an accident or a collapse of the rock mass, they're very difficult to recover and very difficult to replace. Whereas these small systems are much smaller units, we're very familiar with all of them. On cycle duration, any part of the shift is two to three hours at the most. And that means you have seven to eight hours in a 10 hour shift to do any maintenance and repair or, repair or uh, resupply. And all of those units, if they're buried, are relatively easy to recover and replace. So the risk level is lower with these. But the other factor is, what the purpose of our drift is, it's not exactly the same as a tunnel. Tunnels really are usually completed and that's the end of the process for them. In the case of mine drifting, this is actually the beginning of the process for us. And so what we're going to do once we've completed the drift advance is we're going to start to do very large volume ore extraction through blasting or through other methods. And that induces high stress changes around our excavations and it causes damage. And we have to go back and do rehabilitation or repair of those that damage that's done by the stress changes induced by production blasting. And it is very difficult for these large uh, continuous systems to come back and repair that damage. As we know, it is actually relatively easy for the small drill and blast type equipment to come back to, come back to a damaged section of drift, drift and get it repaired. It's not desirable, but it's much, much easier to do than it is with these large machines. And so, because we have lots of post-completion stress change, that's uh, the process that we think is the best one for the future. All of this takes us towards high capacity production systems, autonomous, continuous upgraded systems. I'm sorry, I have a telephone ringing in the background here. There we go, gone. So, what do we mean by that? That takes us back to where we are with increasing ore transfer rates. Here we have the standard LHD that we use for moving ore around our mines. And here's the crucial piece. The payload is at the front end and the machine itself weighs three times the mass of the payload and it comes back empty. 
And that means that for every trip that we take, we are moving six times more mass of machine than we are moving ore. And that means that the, the fuel that we use is roughly a 20-80 split. So 80% of the fuel we burned is to move the LHD, and 20% of the fuel was moved was used to move the ore. And we are actually in the ore moving business, not the machine moving business. If we move to batteries, and that's a very good move to reduce the ventilation cost, but it does make the machines heavier. And so the transition is you have a heavier machine now, and the payload is exactly the same as it was before. The reason for doing all the things we do underground is to move payload, not to be moving equipment. And so how do we make a change here? Batch or transportation system. The problem is essentially that the haul and dump time is very much longer than the loading time. So the ore transport rate that we have typically for our underground operations is 100 to 150 tons an hour, which is 2,000 tons per day per drop point. Very simply, if you dig into the mud pile for maybe 30 seconds and you travel out for two minutes, you dump for 30 seconds at the other end and you travel back for two minutes, that's a complete cycle time of five minutes. But the ore pile utilization is only 30 seconds out of the 300 seconds you used. So you're only touching the ore pile 10% of the time. And it's the ore pile that has value, not the equipment, not the people. That's what a normal theory of constraints business application would say is focus on the utilization of the ore pile because that's where your inventory cost lies. All of the cost that went into creating that ore pile is your inventory cost. So the critical factor is the utilization of the ore pile, which in this configuration is 10% of the time and 90% of the time, no piece of equipment is touching the ore pile at all. That means if you want to have a whole ore pile being moved at any one time, and this system means you have to have 10 uh, draw points with 10 LHDs moving 10% of the time. And that's high inventory cost. The alternative then is to move to these kind of continuous loading systems. Uh, we know that conveyor belts are very, very efficient. 95% of the energy on a conveyor belt is to move the, the product and 5% is to move the belt. But in the kind of material that we want to move in hard rock mines, Conveyor belts are just not possible. But this machine on the left uses a steel conveyor. And that steel conveying system basically means that 25% of the energy is to move the conveyor and 75% is moved to, to move the product. It's not nearly as good as a, a conventional conveyor belt, but it's far superior to a machine where you're moving six times more mass in the equipment than you are in the ore product. So, this configuration then says you now have an ore transfer rate of between 500 and 1,000 tons per hour, just because of the speed at which you can move the conveyor. And that's five to six times faster than you can move the LHDs. So the critical factor here is the utilization of the ore pile. In this case, given shift change, et cetera, you're still going to be moving that mud pile 75 to 90% of the time, almost continuous. It's not completely continuous, but it's much closer to continuous than the 10% performance you have from the batch process. Now, what that means is ore transfer rate of about 750 tons per hour or 16 hours a day means you're moving 10 to 12,000 tons per day for every drop point. Now, in most of the mines I worked in, that's not necessary because the whole mine is only producing five to 10,000 tons per day. And so we don't really need that kind of a system. What it looks like, however, is basically a continuous loader with each one of these self-discharging cars behind it lined up in a line. So the, the rock or the ore moves from one car to the next car to the next car to the next car. Essentially, these are sections of mobile conveyor because in this particular configuration, in the production configuration, they don't need any storage capacity. They simply move ore from the end of the loader to the dump point. And that's a continuous piece of equipment they're stationary most of the time, and when they're stationary, they're in, using direct power from the power lines. And only when they re really need to relocate to a new location, do they become mobile, and that's done on a small battery. This is the kind of mining that needs that kind of production capacity, because these mines, these large block cave mines, are trying to move between 50 and 100,000 tons per day, and some are now aiming to move 150,000 tons per day. 
and they're struggling to achieve these targets. These mines don't use uh, production blasting to break the ore. The ore collapses under its own weight with the stresses, and neither is there any backfilling. So it's by far and away the cheapest mining method if you have a porphyry deposit. The massive deposits that I'm more familiar with personally can't use this particular method because the ore is too strong and it has to be blasted. But these mines have a much different uh, rock strength and they operate in a different way. So that's basically the process with uh, production level and extraction drives and then a haulage level underneath where the trains take away this large material. This is the plan picture of exactly that system. Each of these green lines vertically going from the main axis at the top to the main axis at the bottom, these are the extraction drives. And these extraction drives are about 400 meters long and they have about 20 different drop points all the way along the length of those extraction drives. And so what we tried to do was to do a simulation of this kind of process. You can see that the area in the top right is where the drop points have now uh, pulled to waste and so those are being abandoned. And in the bottom left hand corner, we're actually developing new extraction drives. And so the development front and the production front are moving forward from the top right hand corner down to the left hand corner. So if we think of the the whole picture would be north and south. So it's moving from the northeast diagonally across to the southwest, and that's the production process. There are ore passes on the north periphery of this production system and on the south periphery of the system. And there are also sometimes uh, mid dry passes, but these are very problematic and very difficult to deal with. So we won't really uh, focus on those very much. What we tried to do with this particular simulation, and again, it's a discrete event simulation to show what kind of productivity levels you can get from only 10 extraction drives, roughly 250 meters long strike. And so that's the kind of simulation that we've drawn up together. And this is what the graph shows. So it's comparing the conventional uh, LHD type batch process that's used in these extraction drives versus an autonomous continuous production system using something like the mascot. Mascot doesn't have to be the mascot. It can be some other continuous system, but it's try, trying to compare the production levels of the batch system LHDs to the autonomous continuous production system. So the black lines are the LHDs, and the bottom left, you can see it's the south ore passes. So you're only moving ore to one set of passes, either in the south or in the north. And the best you can achieve there is about uh, 40,000 tons per day. If you move, your, move ore from these draw points to both north and south ore passes, the dashed black line takes you very close to 70,000 tons a day. And that's the solution that you get. If you use a continuous production system and you only deliver ore to one set of ore passes, either in the south or in the north, you'll achieve roughly the same kind of production level at 70,000 tons per day. But the dashed line is to say that the continuous production system moving ore to both the north and the south ore passes achieves a production level of 100,000 tons a day. So that's 1,000 tons per extraction drive per day. And that was the target, and that's what the system was designed to accomplish. Now, the simulator also provides information on how many drives you would need for this one directional LHD system to achieve 100,000 tons per day. And you'd need 33 drives, not 10, 33. And you can do the same thing with the LHDs. Uh, going to north and south, and for that case, you would need 28 drives. So the average is about 30 drives of LHDs moving ore back and forth to achieve a production capacity of 100,000 tons per day. That's achieved with 10 drives in the north and south configuration, and that blue solid line requires 19 drives. Obviously, if you're delivering ore to two sets of ore passes rather than one set of passes, then you're going to need roughly uh, twice as many drives to achieve 100,000 tons per day. So we can see how those two systems look. Now you can imagine, however, that that whole row of continuous vehicles moving ore continuously in the continuous production system is much more expensive than the LHDs, and they absolutely are. And so if you look at the batch equipment for the extraction drives, it's $2 million per LHD times 30 drives is $100 million, $120 million for the batch equipment. And each extraction drive costs about $15 million to create, and you need 30 of those. And so your total cost of capital outlay is about $570 million for the batch equipment process. 
as I said, the CPS system is much, much more expensive. It's going to cost you at least $20 million per drive for each extraction drive. But in this case, you only need 10 extraction drives. And so the total equipment cost is going to be about $200 million. It's a lot more than the $120 million for the 30 uh, scoop trams, but there we go, uh, for the 60 scoop trams rather. So, but you only need 10 extraction drives. So 10 extraction drives at $15 million each means the total extraction or infrastructure cost is $150 million. So the total capital outlay is $350 million to achieve a production capacity of 100,000 tons per day. So that's where we are. Oh, I guess I'm way past my time. So that's just the system. We also need to move on to fewer people, autonomous vehicles, comp comprehensive PPE, ventilation and communication systems. This is what it will look like. This takes us back to the diesel engines, replacing those with batteries, which is a very good first step. It also creates a personal uh, safety issue because personal protective equipment, silent batteries, underground conditions, very difficult. So we have a warning helmet that flashes to tell people what's happening. You can even have noise cancelling earphones. You do need to bring in compressed air. We brought in compressed air through a hydraulic air compressor, but we do think that the long-term future is the cooling of liquid air decompression. And that can also be used in vehicles to move the vehicles around and also produce exhaust uh, decompressing air. That means that instead of being dressed like this, as we have been for the last 40, 50 years, we can actually move to a protective system that's much more like a spacesuit. You have very few people on the ground. They're all protected with a helmet and a continued complete system where they're cooled inside, and that is the kind of system we can move to. So we have an electrified autonomous continuous system. There's the equipment moving from the LHDs that we have today. It's taken us 40 years to consider this transition. I think we can complete the transition by 2025 and move to a much higher production level. And in terms of people, we're going to look not the way we did on the left-hand side, the way we have done since I joined the industry in 1975, but moving towards many, many fewer people underground, but with much, much higher levels of capacity in terms of communication and protection against all the hazards, heat, humidity, as well as physical injuries and far superior communication systems built into the helmet. All of this is to produce a lower operating costs. That means you can then have a lower cutoff grade for the mines, and more ore means a longer mine life. And that's what we're trying to accomplish with the operations that we currently have. It would be great if we could actually move forward to producing more mines and opening more mines faster, but that's difficult for us to do. And that actually takes us back to the new tailing storage systems, which I'm not going to focus on. So let's finish here by just saying this is the kind of systems that we have. I'm happy to take any questions we have because we're running out of time. So let me stop talking and answer any questions that any of you have. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. That was uh, very informative, and we do have uh, we have a question in the chat right now. And I would encourage uh, the participants online right now um, if you have any questions, please uh, please put them in the chat, um, and then we'll take them up as uh, as they come along. So the first question, Doug, if you are ready, I will read it out. Yep. Uh, is by Carmine um, Siriello. Uh, and they're asking, how are you convincing the mining industry to embrace discrete event models and bottleneck or constraint theory to drive improvement and decision making? Very few operations, I'm sorry to say, have adopted this particular technique. We think it is the way of the future. Uh, there's a lot of discussion now about digital twinning, which is an even more advanced process because it actually uses not just the spreadsheet output that we get from a discrete event simulation, but it actually shows all the equipment moving. It's much more sophisticated, and it may well be that we need a more sophisticated uh, uh, simulation process for the mining industry to buy into, rather than just the relatively simple step of moving to discrete event simulations. So as I say, we have not been very successful at getting acceptance for this particular technique, but uh, the result is that there's relatively few changes taking place that improve mm -hmm. the product 
parsley or gone white. Uh, I have a question from Phil. Uh, will these new methods leave more of the waste rock underground? Ah, very good question. It is certainly possible to do that, and I did mention in the third bottom line, upgrading, which I didn't uh, touch on at all, that means improving the value of the ore. Oftentimes it's called ore starting, and that means removing the low-grade ore or the waste material from the flow of ore and leaving that underground. It is absolutely possible to do that in open stopping mines with backfill systems because mm -hmm. it's then possible to set up uh, an equipment loop to move the material, the waste material that's been removed from the ore stream, you can move that and consume that in the backfill system. So in open sloping operations with backfill, you can absolutely leave more of the waste rock underground. The problem for the very, very large block caving mines is that they don't have a backfill system. And so their problem is that they don't really have anywhere to put the reject material from the upgrading process, whether you call it uh, ore uh, sorting, or in my case, I would call it waste removal or waste diversion from the ore stream. The problem is, where do you put the rejected material? It's very mm -hmm. easy to do on surface, so it's very easy for open pit mines to do this, but underground mines have a few difficulties to overcome in order to leave more of the valueless uh, waste material behind. Absolutely the right thing to do, but it's not quite so simple for underground mines to accomplish. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so both Carmine and Phil have said thank you for your answer and we have a couple more questions. I see a question from uh, William Quesnel um, and they are asking, do you see any new innovations in drilling, say automated drilling units, build into the protective canopy that swing into position and automatically drill the next round, then retract back into the canopy? Yeah, that's exactly how we would see that. We wouldn't see it being retracted back into the into the uh, canopy, Bill. We would mm -hmm. see it as being part of the vehicle that moves in underneath the canopy. And so, yes, completely uh, speeding up that drilling process. Uh, as you know, in, in the old days, when we were doing it manually, we had to drill one hole and install one bolt and do that in sequence. Since we have an automated process underneath the canopy, we're protected from the rock falls by the frame and by the mesh on the other side and so we can actually be drilling four holes or six holes at a time mm -hmm. and uh, not uh, engage you know we can speed up that whole process by having multiple drilling multiple holes being drilled at the same time and then the whole system then installing those bolts in that ring and then the whole rig of drills moves to a certain angle rotates and then installs another set of bolts that is the next step on beyond that, and that will reduce the time component of the drilling system. So, yes, Bill Canal, that is exactly the way of the future. Great. Um, I have a couple more questions, and I think we will wrap it up after the three that I have in line. Uh, the first one is from uh, Eric Strom, and he says, thanks, Doug, very informative as always. How important is the conveyor in the smaller haulage vehicles? Uh, it would seem that the side-by-side -side loading from the HAG loader could achieve the majority of the improvement. Certainly, if you're looking at the, uh, the drift heading, that is the th thing that makes a difference, is moving the mark out of the heading, yes. Uh, so in drift development, the, the HAG loader type configuration is exactly the way to do it. All we've done is made it electric and made it, made it, uh, make it autonomous. And that's the way of that mm -hmm. particular component. In the production piece, however, you don't need any storage capacity as you do in what we would call the hard car. And so yeah. that basically is just a transition from one type of vehicle to the other. And it means there's a couple of other small modifications you have to do. But in both cases, it's all just about moving the material faster and not using, not moving machines to do that. But certainly, if you want to drop me a line, we can talk about that in much more detail. And that's true for anybody who's been listening. If you want to drop me a line, I'm happy to try and answer the questions more completely later. Next. 
Yes, that's uh, that's great. Thanks, Doug. Um, and I have um, I have two more questions. Uh, I think they're maybe sort of related, but I'm going to read them out together. One, the first one from Bayer. Um, Hi, Bayer. Uh, in CPS or batch system, how the dust creation will be addressed? And then the next one by Tracy Holmes. Uh, is there a maximum particle size for the ore and the haulage vehicles? Yes. So the size, I'll answer the second one first because it's easier. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, there is. And it's basically the jaws of the continuous loader. And so that's the thing that controls the size of the, the material moving through the whole system. If it can move on to the loading conveyor, then it has to be able to move through the entire system. So all the vehicles behind, whether they have storage capacity or not, have exactly the same movement capacity and size capacity as the loader itself. So the loader defines uh, the largest size you can have. The advantage of a loader over an LHD is that mm -hmm. the loader typically can have uh, what we call a cherry picker or a hydraulic hammer on the end of the arm, and that can reduce some of the oversize to make sure that the material can continue to move through the jaws of the loader and move on down through the flow system. So that's one way to modify it. Dust, of course, is a big, big issue. And I believe that the way that's going to be managed in the future, certainly on drilling dust, uh, should be controlled by using uh, what I think is the liquid air cooling mechanism inside the drill uh, head and capture the dust at the drill head, whether it's an ITH uh, component. So capture the the, the chip, the chips and the dust from the drilling into a canister by using a Venturi system that uses the decompressing uh, compressed air and captured the dust at source at the color of the hole, whether it's the vertical holes for production or the horizontal holes in the face. Capture that dust at the face, and, uh, eliminate the problem, because one of our problems underground is humidity. And if we stop using water to cool things, then we can use decompressing liquid air to cool things down, so long as we capture the dust. In the case of a drop point, yes, we've actually configured a system where you actually essentially use a set of balloons at the heading and surround those vehicles when they're, uh, and you can capture all the dust again using a decompression system and a venturi system to capture the dust in the heading so that the rest of the operation behind the active phase is not subject to the dust that would normally be flowing through that system. Remember, because we're producing, we're, we're delivering targeted cooling, we're no longer moving the vast the numbers of, of air through the whole system that moves dust through the whole system. So there's no question, controlling dust and managing dust, dust and capturing dust is an issue that has to be addressed. I don't have 100% of the answers, but I think the solutions to this problem are achievable. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, Doug. And uh, like you mentioned, um, the participants are uh, welcome to uh, connect with you offline for detailed discussions, I believe. Yes, please, yes. No problem. All right. And uh, and the other question that uh, I, I guess most uh, participants are wondering or might have asked as well, Eric, thank you, I see your question. Uh, a recording of this uh, presentation will be posted on the CIM GTA West um, events page soon. So definitely uh, you can go up there and refer to, uh, to today's um, presentation topic as well as the discussion. Um, and uh, it will be posted uh, probably by end of this week. So um, definitely check it out. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Doug. It was uh, great having you as the speaker today. And the pre presentation was definitely very informative, as we can see from the questions and also the, uh, the feedback that uh, we have received so far. Uh, so I thank you for your time on behalf of the uh, CIM GTA West chapter. And hope you also had a good time presenting uh, the topic. I know we ran a little short with time. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's good. Yeah. Anyway, there we are. It was yeah. better to focus on the things we focused on rather than.